Hi, so I'm Nancy. Uh, I'm going to be the one giving the talk on accessibility. If you can't hear me, I'm sorry in advance. Please just yell at me and I will pick up the mic and actually use the mic. Um, otherwise, I'll just try not to use the mic. Um, so anyways, we are going to be talking about accessibility. A uh, quick qu thing about me, uh, just so you know, you know that I'm a real person. Um, I live in Atlanta and I have two dogs and they're named Karma and Kazi and they're cute and adorable. Uh, and uh, I do work with um, Automatic. I just started a few months ago. I work with Jetpack, so if you see me, you'll see me at the table downstairs right at the base of the staircase. And, uh, and I also run a company called Misfit Ideas. We do video production stuff, um, short movies and uh, advertisements and things like that. So, um, all right, so we're going to start with, can you guys see this well enough? Is this like bright enough or no? Okay. okay. Um, so we're going to start with something that you guys have hopefully seen at least once. Um, so this is the, the schedule for WordCamp Asheville, right? It's, it's pretty and, and adorable and everything. Um, and so in terms of accessibility, the first thing that generally comes to mind is colorblindness, right? That's a fairly common thing that people talk about when they talk about accessibility. So if you were um, going to be looking at this website and you had color the most common form of colorblindness, which is called yeah, I'm going to screw this up. Deuteranopia. We're going to pretend I say that, said that correctly. Um, and so basically, it's red and green color blindness. It's the most common kind. Um, a lot of, like 8% of males have it in any varying form, right, um, on the range. So um, this is what you would see if, well, you can't really see it that well. This is what you would allegedly see if, uh, if, you were, if you had any form of color blindness. So when you look at this first slide, you can see these colors that are, you know, they're noting what you're looking at. And you can say, oh, the light green one, that's the one that I'm looking at. Um, so this is just a very small thing. It's not that it's illegible entirely. It's not that you can't, you know, read the site or anything. But it's something to keep in mind that when you have blue and green color blindness, things sort of blend together. You know, they sort of just merge together, and that's something to keep in mind in terms of contrast. So the next one. All right. So we're just going to do a few examples at first so you guys can kind of see what, like, have pictures in your head for what I talk about later. Um, so this is for uh, WordCamp Barcelona, and it's really pretty. It's a, it's a very, like, it's a very nice looking site. Um, the problem is, is that it uses pink as its only uh, indication of something to look at. Right? So if you look at Gracias, it's highlighted, but the only thing that highlights it is its color. So if you have color blindness, that's what you see. And nothing is actually really prominent at that point. Right? And sure, there's different levels of color blindness, and you might see it a little bit more. But it's, an, it's a thing to keep in mind in terms of contrast when you're thinking about putting together color profiles for sites as a designer. Or if you're developing a site and you just have that in mind, you can recommend to people, hey, well, people might not be able to see this. And it might not even be color blindness. It could just be people are hard of seeing, right? If you're older and you have, you just don't see contrast as well. Um, if you're just doing it, if you're just focusing on one way to highlight something, you have a single point of failure, basically. Because that means that if somebody can't see color, then they'd have no reason to really be focused on the thing that you want them to focus on. Um, but that doesn't mean that red is bad. I'm not saying like never use red or anything. So like for WordCamp um, main, red is obviously very prominent, uh, kind of obviously. My slides are up. If you check out, uh, if you want to see this a little bit more clearly, I do have, I posted the slides about an hour ago on Twitter. Um, and you guys can look at it through your computers if that's easier. Um, and so they use red as their main color. And you're like, oh, crap, red is bad. Well, not really, because if you look at it like this and you take out all of the red, there's still, there's still distinction between the two colors. So that kind of, I mean, I'm a little uh, repeating myself, but um, it's a lot about just making sure that there's contrast within whatever you are highlighting. So if you have red, then have something that's not green, because red and green will merge together and no one will be able to read anything. So, uh, and this example, so um, this is for WordCamp Montreal, and they use purple and this gold kind of color. Uh, and if you look at it with, um, with color blindness, it doesn't look really any different. If you, if you look at it really, really closely, there's a bit of green that fades away that's in, in the first image. Um, it's a little less contrasty, but um, 
it's basically still completely legible. And whatever is highlighted is still remains highlighted. Uh, so things to keep in mind. Now, the whole point of accessibility. Uh, so Tim Berners-Lee is kind of a big deal. Uh, he sort of created the World Wide Web and everything. Uh, so this is a quote. <laughs> um, the power of the web is in its universality. Access by everyone, regardless of disability, is an essential aspect. So the point of the internet is to try and make it accessible for anyone, right? It doesn't matter, matter whether you're rich or poor or blind or not, you know? It should be available to anyone that wants access to the content of the internet. So um, it's even gone so far as the UN states it as a basic human right. Um, web accessibility, especially in this day and age, because everyone uses the web in some form of, or another, should be a basic human right. And just because you are hard of hearing or you can't see or, you know, whatever, shouldn't be something that blocks you from using the internet. So, um, basically this means that if you actually have a and it's not saying that web accessibility or all of these different things that I'm going to talk about, you have to incorporate every single thing or you're not a good human being. Um, it just means that these things will help you help people, right? If you have a business, then you want it to be accessible to the most amount of people, right? You don't want to just like cut off 20% of the human race to be like, well, sucks to be you, uh, but we're just going to do it our way. Um, as a business owner, one would think that you'd want as large an audience as possible. Um, and it, like I said, it doesn't mean you have to do everything, but even if you incorporate one thing, that, that helps. It's one step forward. Um, so basically, if you do start incorporating these sorts of things, then you have potential clients and you have worldwide users. And ultimately, that means that you have a more accessible internet as a whole. I see like lots of blank faces and I'm a little afraid to go keep going. Everyone with me? Okay. All right, cool. <laughs> okay, so facts. Uh, these are, well, just statistics. 20 million, there are 20 million blind adults in the United States. It's not a completely, like, fully accurate fact because that number will continue to change as populations grow, um, but basically. And about 10% of the, of the blind U.S. Americans will use screen readers. I'm hoping that the ceiling doesn't fall in my head. Um, <laughs> Yesterday, a ceiling fan almost fell on my head, so I'm a little, there's a little bit of PTSD on that one. Uh, <laughs> uh, and 8% of men um, are blind, and 0.5% of women are colorblind. So, uh, sorry, colorblind and colorblind. And so these might seem like smallish numbers, or you know, you might think, well, what's, eh, what's 8%? Um, but there's a lot of other reasons to, use, to look into web accessibility other than just, well, someone is blind. That sucks to be you. But, do not think that. I don't think that either. There's a recording, so I don't want people to say that. Um, but so basically, like the most common form is the word that I cannot pronounce. Um, but uh, basically, when, yeah. So eight percent is of the human of of Americans of the three hundred ish million. Eight percent are colorblind, give or take. Um, so. A normal, hu like normal human eyesight sees the, the entire color spectrum, right? So it's the one on the left you see, you know, red, yellow, green, blue. Um, but if you have color blindness, then um, or the most common form, you see blue and you see this goldish, greenish color of whatever that color is called. Um, and so basically it just, m it just merges all of the colors into two, right? So red and green are opposite on the color spectrum, but you can see how they sort of um, so green is in the top left, and then red is in the bottom right, and it sort of merges into this like goldish color. Uh, in the earlier slide examples, there was a bit of that, you could kind of see it, um, like the red became that like goldish puke color. Um, <laughs> Uh, so yeah, so anyways, um, there's, like I said, there's a lot more than just um, colorblindness as a disability and why you should think about web accessibility. So there's auditory, cognitive, neurological, physical, and visual. Um, auditory is, well, hearing. So um, if you guys are thinking about various sounds on your websites, right, some people put music or various sound effects on their sites. Um, again, looking at that as not just one single point of failure. So if you are going to use sound for some sort of effect, then make sure that you have um, like if you have a video, then you have captioning or um, some sort of indi other indication other than just sound so people can know that something's happening. Um, for cognitive neurological, that's 
a, a bit of it is you can't really help that, right? You have to make sure that other peop the, the people are using various types of products to help them. Um, but, like, for example, dyslexia is a fairly common thing, and there's various types of fonts you can use that um, at least help to make sure that people, when they're reading it, don't, it doesn't trigger dyslexia as strongly. Um, there, are, there's a, there is a font called Dyslexic, I believe, um, and it just came out. And you can use something that's really, really specific like that, but even using something like Arial versus a really swirly font um, can help a lot in terms of when people are reading so they don't, you know, know they actually know what they're reading. Um, and then in terms of physical things, so um, a lot of people will use um, various, if they have little hand motion, for example, and they can only move their fingers, and so they don't have a mouse and things like that. So they'll use an arrow key. Um, and so if they, if they use that, then, you know, making sure that if you're using, like, JavaScript on your site, then make sure that it's, it's not just so convoluted and it's not so layered that people can't interact with the site with arrows, right? Um, and visual is things like color blindness, but also just um, if you can't see at all, then you're going to be using a screen reader, for example. Um, the easiest way to know what it feels like to use a screen reader, if you, um, I'm not sure for, for Windows, but for Macs, there's a thing called voiceover, and you can turn it on um, with a couple of shortcuts. And uh, if you turn it on and you go to a page, have it read with voiceover, and it is fairly annoying to read a website with voiceover. Um, I, I did it for about 30 minutes this morning to try and like, I was thinking I would just, you know, play it for you guys, but I didn't want to subject you to that. Um, but it's just basically, if you, it's reading everything that's on the page. So if it's not organized or structured in any sort of recognizable way, it'll just be reading gobbledygook, right? It'll just like go, because it starts at the top of the page and goes down. It doesn't know that, oh, well, I, ex I wanted you guys to look on the left side of the screen and then the bottom right of the screen and then in the top right corner. And, you know, like, because visually you would say, all right, well, I can say, let's look at the red thing in the bottom left corner and then let's look in the middle of the screen and then, you know, like, guide the eye, right? But if you do that with a screen reader, the screen reader's not going to know that. So it's just going to read top down. Um, and if you guys have questions in the middle, just feel free to raise your hand, by the way. Uh, so things that people use, assistive technologies that are fairly common. Um, so there's Braille displays that people can uh, use, which I think are really fascinating because you actually can feel, you have to feel Braille. And so you can read a website using a Braille reader. Uh, screen readers, um, text-to-speech. Voice browsers, voice recognition, keyboard navigation, all these different things are fairly common things that people will use. Um, screen readers are one of the most common ways that people use to interact with websites. So these are a couple of things to just be in, in uh, just know about because they exist and, you know, just know that they exist. Um, and so what makes a website accessible and how can you know if yours is accessible? Because that's kind of the whole point of this talk, right? Um, so there's things like uh, type of content, size and complexity, development tools, and environment. So we're going to break them down a little bit more. So um, what makes a website accessible? Uh, things like, wow, that is not legible. OK, uh, intuitive navigation, properly labeled links and images, and user-friendly design aesthetics. Those are fairly common things that you should be thinking about anyways when you're creating a website. Right? You want people to, even if you're not thinking about accessibility at all, you want it to be legible and you want people to be able to understand what your site is doing and what the point of it is and, you know, point them, guide them in the direction you want them to go, right? And all of these things mean that people will, will engage with your content more. It, it, you want people to stay on your site if you're thinking about SEO, right? You're thinking about click-through rates, you're thinking about all these other things. So if you create a site that is pleasant to visit, and it's not, you know, 70 different colors and lots of images and, uh, like, it's just, it's a gobbledygook of craziness. Um, people aren't going to want to stick around because they won't understand what's going on. So it's just even something as simple as organizing your site and making sure that there's, um, the navigation makes sense, right? Uh, I see a lot, I see this a lot. Um, I used to make websites for various clients, and I saw this a lot in larger sites. It gets, the larger the site gets, the harder it is to manage and organize. Um, but that's something to really keep in mind because if you don't have it organized in such a way that makes sense or that's a fairly common use practice, um, 
people won't know how to engage. For example, I, we did a site for a nonprofit that had uh, give or take 500 pages. That's a lot. Um, but their main navigation, just their parent pages, were so convoluted that it didn't really make sense why there was an about page that wasn't near the home page. It was, and then the, um, the board members weren't in the about. They were over there in like contact and you know, things like that. Like, it's fairly simple, but just something to keep in mind, even as something as simple as organization. Uh, so what can you do? Uh, th so there's things like uh, content formats. So like I'd mentioned before about videos, if you're using videos, then have um, different ways to engage with the videos. You don't just have to see it to understand what's going on. You can, they explain it. Or if you don't have to hear it to know what's going on, you can read something, right? Uh, and then presentation, um, distinguishing visual content and providing ways to understand audio content. Um, so basically just when you are showing it, don't just have hidden surprises, basically. Um, for example, a lot of sites will have music playing when you visit them, which is thankfully going out of date, but uh, it does still happen. Uh, but there's no way to turn it off. Like, other than just turning your volume off on your speakers entirely. Just don't make it, don't make users guess how to use your site. It should be fairly obvious, unless it's, you know, I guess like a Nancy Drew game, then make them guess. But other than that, don't do that. <laughs> um, so um, what are some things that you can use to figure out what the sites that you're using right now, that you're building, that you've built before? Um, these are different tools that you can use. They're all links, so um, if you do visit the site, uh, or visit the slideshow, then you'll be able to click on them and visit their respective home pages. But these are different tools that you can use to evaluate whether your site is accessible in different ways. Um, so the examples from the beginning of the, sh the slideshow was I used Chrome Spectrum. It's a new extension that Chrome just introduced, uh, or a developer introduced for Chrome a little while ago. And so what it does is it gives you a list of, um, I believe, seven different uh, color blindnesses. And so you can see just and it's a very quick and easy way to just see, all right, this page, does it make sense? Does it not make sense? Are things merging together or not? Um, it's only specifically for colorblindness, and, uh, but it, it is a really handy, quick way to see what's going on. Um, the other, all the other tools, Color Oracle is a lot more um, intensive. It, it provides a lot more ways to see uh, what you're doing right in terms of accessibility. Um, same goes with Wave and Web Accessibility Checker, A Checker, et cetera. Uh, and uh, so yeah, so why do this at all? Uh, it's you know not necessarily the easiest thing to do or implement into your site. So basically, this is a fancy picture that I found on the internet, and uh, it it explains things a lot better than I can. Um, basically, when you start using accessibility accessible features, right? If you start making your site accessible, then if, as a designer, then as a developer, then a developer will have to start implementing it, right? And if a developer has to start implementing it, then people will start offering those services more. And if they're offered more just on a wide, wider basis, then people will design it more because it's kind of an expected thing, right? It's, it's a cycle of like, as one thing starts, like the dominoes start falling, you know? And it, it just becomes like the cycle of, well, it's available, so I should use it. Rather than, ugh, I don't want to use it, whatever, people aren't using it, blah, blah, blah. Does that make sense? Yeah? Nodding, maybe? OK. <laughs> um, and this is a little bit more intensive. It's basically the same cycle. But what it, what it talks about is that, so all of these different things are coming together. And there's a lot of pieces that uh, make up a website. Right? There's, there's a lot that goes on. Even if you are just taking a theme and you're just putting content in, just making sure everything works with your content. Right? Um, and so putting, like, just keeping all of these things in mind, uh, it helps a lot. Um, it sounds really dorky, but it really does help to just have that on, on hold. And you can always just like, pull it up and be like, all right, well, I'm, a, I'm using these, like, these media things, are they actually going to work or are they just like overkill and I'm just, you know, being too fancy and it's not working. Um, but yeah. Anyways, <laughs> benefits for others. Uh, so web accessibility, like I keep saying, is more than just colorblindness or, you know, hard of seeing. Um, it helps, it's connected to so much more. So um, web standards are you know, people have, the, have web standards that are set up to say, all right, websites should follow these 
guidelines, right? Accessibility is one of them, um, but it helps with all these other things. So digital divide issues, um, people, not everyone uses digital things, right? And they're introduced, for example, my parents have had flip phones forever um, and they just got smartphones about three months ago. So they went from just calling me and they don't even text. I, I've taught them to text several times, um, but they don't text. And they went straight from calling me to FaceTiming me. And so they only FaceTime me now. It's, it's adorable, but it's like, whoa, that was a big leap. Um, they sometimes send pictures now. They've sort of gotten into that, but they don't like texting, right? Because it's, uh, we're from India and so they don't like typing in English. And Gujarati is not really, you know, it's hard to do that. So um, they don't like typing. They'll send voice messages. They'll, you know, call me. They will do, they will do everything, but they won't type. So it's, it's things like that. When you're dealing with different cultures or different um, age groups, uh, like my 10-year-old cousin can take apart a phone and put it back together, and he's way more of a whiz than I will ever be, um, all the way to my, like my grandmother learning to FaceTime as well. It's cute and adorable, but uh, it's a very, you can see the wide range of people. Um, mobile access. So the last time I read this, this statistic was that 55% of the world um, that uses the internet uses it on a mobile device. So sure, it's not just phones, but it's tablets, it's you know, any sort of mobile device. But that's something to keep in mind when you're building a site. Google like, I mean, did implement the whole, if you don't have a mobile responsive site, then you're going to get penalized. And that, I guess, helps kind of. But just keeping that in mind, because some people still don't really care. Uh, but if you, if you know that at least half of your audience is going to be on a mobile device, then you, I would hope, want the people to have an easy time accessing your site, right? Um, even if it's something as simple as just, uh, for example, using a plugin that just makes the site mobile responsive. That's not the best way. I don't highly recommend that. But at least it's a step up than just, you know, seeing everything in like, one centimeter tall text that you can't read and you know all of that sort of stuff. Um, older users needs, uh, keeping that in mind um, as populations grow, also do the older generations, the number of people in older generations. Keeping that in mind that it's not just really simple to just have this really flashy site that works for 20 year olds, you need to make sure that it works for all ages. Um, low literacy fluency, um, different if there is a language barrier of some kind, then keeping that in mind that it's not just a wall of text, for example. Um, low bandwidth connections and older technology, that sort of goes back to the mobile technology. A lot of people will use it on cell phones, right? They might not have as much access or internet access, um, and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, new and frequent users and mobile phone users. Um, so having said all of that, what's in it for me? We've talked you know, about what's in it for everyone else, but why should you do it anyways if you don't really care about all of that either? Um, so, does it matter how accessible your content is if nobody f ever finds it? So you've done, you know, you've made the site. It's beautiful, it's gorgeous, but if no one can find it, then what's the point of all the hard work? Um, so it kind of goes back to this slide from earlier, is that, you know, if you, if you put all of these things together, that will help people find and stay on your site. But there's things like accessibility can help so much with SEO. Um, and that's something that I've often got, gotten questions for. I have the site, it's beautiful. Why is no one visiting it? Um, and that's a, that's a huge topic that I could in no way cover in, in my talk alone. But it's one thing that accessibility can help with a lot. Um, so, for example, um, alt tags. Have you, have you guys heard of alt tags? Yes? Okay. Um, so alt tags are like a really, really simple way to incorporate accessibility into your sites. Because an alt tag, so what we see is this guy holding, you know, grapes. It's cool. It's a pretty picture, whatever. Um, and the image, say the image file is called grapes.jpg, right? That's, I mean, kind of uh, descriptive, sort of, right? You know it's grapes, but you don't know the context of what the grapes are. So if you put in an alt tag that says a man holding a bundle of grapes, then that helps with context of the image because that means that if somebody is searching on Google for an image of a man holding grapes, that's going to be much more likely to show up than any other image that just says grapes.jpg. Right? But it also helps with screen readers. That helps, you know, just hearing grapes.jpg is not necessarily very helpful unless you have a ton of context around it. But if you hear that, oh, okay, it's a man holding a, holding a bunch of grapes, then, okay, you can at least sort of understand con contextually a little bit more of what's going on on the page. Obviously a very simple example, but you guys get the gist of it. Um, so 
you can't read that, I'm sorry. Um, this is just, a, it's a list of things that you guys can do as, you know, try to make your site more accessible, whether it's for um, various disabilities or it's for SEO purposes. Um, so I, I can try and read them, that might be more helpful. Um, providing a clear and, providing clear and proper heading structure and avoiding empty headings. So that's a little self-explanatory. Um, providing descriptive text link. So instead of, this is one really big thing. A lot of people use click here. Click here is great for people to know to click here, but if they don't know what they're clicking on, then it's just another click here tag. And that, that's it, and that doesn't give any sort of context. It's helpful for screen readers, but it's really helpful for just knowing what's on the page. Because if Google is indexing your site and you just say click here 30 times, they won't, won't know anything about what your site's about. But if you say, you know, check out my awesome images of Yosemite, then that at least, you know, Google will know at least has something to do with Yosemite and pictures. Um, ensuring page titles are descriptive yet succinct. Keep them short, if at all possible, but make them descriptive. Um, try it, like, I mean, an about page is pretty descriptive, but if you have a blog post, right, try and keep the title short, but try and also, you know, don't stuff it full of keywords, but make it descriptive as well. Um, not relying on, on JavaScript for things that don't need it. Uh, that's another big thing. JavaScript is pretty, and it's beautiful, and it's awesome, um, but you don't necessarily need it at all times. Um, and just keeping that in mind. Um, avoiding mouse-dependent interaction. It goes back to if anyone's using a keyboard for any reason. Um, if you have to scroll or you have to like move your mouse pointer around, then you should be, you know, that's not necessarily the easiest way to get around on the website. Um, using standard web formats when possible. That goes to web standards and just reading up on that. There's a great document and I'm gonna link to it in, at the end. Um, but it, it talks about web standards in its totality. Just it's not it's not boring. I promise. He actually you know uses entertaining language, um, but it's uh, it's it's kind of long. And but it just you know defines all these different web standards as they are, kind of today. It was, it was published a few months ago, um, and so he breaks down. All right, so web standards is a thing. Now what the hell is web standards? Sorry. What the heck is web standards? <laughs> um, uh, and so it just breaks down what they are, and then accessibility is a part of it, but it's not the whole, whole shebang of the article. Um, and it just explains, all right, so there's different groups of people that it helps, but why, why should you care about web accessibility? Um, you, should ex you should care about it because of people, but you should also care about it because of software, right? If you, if you start incorporating these different things, it's gonna help your site um, do better in search engines. It's, gonna, it's just gonna make it a better, happy, happier site in general. Um, all right, uh, do you guys want me to go through all of these or would you guys like to, yeah, go ahead. That's a great question. I don't remember the name of the author, but I do link to it in, in the next slide. Um, so yeah, <laughs> sorry about that guys. I should know this. Um, I can keep going through all of these or if you guys have questions, uh, I don't wanna just like keep talking at you. I'd much rather you guys, you know, talk and move around and stuff. So, for example, on the calendar, mm -hmm. the events are on the calendar, right. and you would need a hover event to see a toolkit. Sure, about yeah. Mm -hmm. What would be a good way? Um, so, okay, for calendars, I found that like if you list list them or provide a different way to view the calendar. Um, a lot of people will have like a print friendly calendar or something, right? But if you have a print friendly calendar, then you need to define it as well because if it's just a PDF, then you still can't read it. Um, and so there's different, like you can, I've seen like the, the best uses that I've seen have been if you have the different views, right? You can see like the calendar and for like, regular people that are view, visiting the site, they can just, you know, hover and it'll be great. Um, but if you also allow for a different view of the calendar, even if it's something as simple as a list and you just go date by date and you just break it down into like bullets of some kind, um, that's even more helpful than just, uh, it's, it's a little bit more work. I know people don't want to hear that, but it's not that much more work and it, it does help a lot more than just hovering, you know. Um, okay, I can keep going and you guys can interrupt. Does that work? Okay. <laughs> um, 
So the next thing, all right, identifying, or sorry, providing transcripts and captions for video. Uh, I think this is like the third time I've said this, but if you have a video, please caption it. Uh, it's really easy, and if you have, if it's like a story that you've done, if it's like a short film, you already have the script. Like you just have to like time it, and that's it. Try not to use Google captioning services just yet because they will caption it enter in entertaining ways. YouTube has a captioning service, and it's great a lot of the time. But I would, if you do use it, please like check it before you publish it because sometimes it'll use. <laughs> As she knows, um, it'll use entertaining, uh, entertaining ways of transcribing your language. Um, <laughs> Is that changeable? Like, like, you yeah, you can. So they want to make it better. So they they love when people tell them you're wrong because then they know how to make that algorithm better to understand what people are saying. Because they don't understand all accents, or they can't. You know, I talk really fast, so they probably can't understand me at all. Or if you guys can't tell me, um, <laughs> and so yeah, just they they are improving it. It's gotten vastly better. When it first was introduced, it was complete gobbledygook. There's this video that went semi-viral on YouTube about people captioning their video. So they made like this music video, and they captioned. They used YouTube to caption it, and then it was totally messed up. And then they sang the video with the YouTube captions, and then recaptioned it, <laughs> and it messed it up even more. And uh, they did this like three or four rounds. And by the end of it, it was a complete mess. Like even like the A's and the does weren't A's and does anymore. Um, so yeah, uh, keep that in mind. <laughs> Identifying the language of pages and page content. This is obviously a little more important if you have an international audience. But um, if you have different languages on your site and people aren't using Google Chrome, for example, to translate everything, then just indicating that hey, this is in English, this is in French, this is in um, Italian, etc. Uh, allowing multiple ways of finding content. So um, you can use like a search bar, which is great. Um, also including something like a sitemap. You should already kind of be doing that if you want Google to index your site anyways. Uh, table of contents or uh, clear navigation structure. Um, all of these things are different ways to make sure that the, the content on your site is structured legibly. Um, it doesn't mean you have to use like you know all five things, but just keep those in mind, especially if your site is getting bigger. Uh, for example, um, I have a photography site, right? So I have like a, a lot of images. If I don't use some sort of organizing structure on it, it's just a blog page of lots of posts and images and nothing else, right? So um, keeping that in mind, right? Providing useful links to related and relevant resources. Um, this kind of goes back to click here. If you are linking to things, try and describe what you're linking to. Try not to just use the URL link either, because URL links are often not descriptive in their own right. Um, but if you do say, you know, you're linking to, um, I don't know, uh, you're linking to Google.com, right? Uh, if you say, don't say click here, say, hey, check out Google Image Search or something, right? If you're using images.google.com. Um, <laughs> let's see. Ensuring URLs are human readable and logical. Uh, I just keep saying things before I need to say them. Um, so URLs are not necessarily legible and logical, and you know there's a lot of numbers and letters and stuff. Um, try and change that. So like for WordPress, you can change your your permalink, right? You can just go in and say, all right, well I had this really long title and that was a mistake, so I'm gonna trim it down and change it. Obviously, make sure if you've already linked it to somewhere else, you follow that that rabbit hole. But um, just try and make sure that these links are not just you know, numbers and letters for something. Um, presenting a clear and consistent navigation and page structure. Uh, that goes, a little, goes back to sitemaps or um, navigation bars in general. Uh, it's really easy to put in a menu. Uh, <laughs> and there's a camera pointing right at me. Um, and so. <laughs> Um, and so it's really easy to put in a menu, right? You, if for WordPress especially, you just literally go to menu and you build one. Um, try and make it logical. Try, like you can, you can um, drag things to the right, right? And so you can like sub, na do sub menus underneath things. So you can or organize the content. It's really easy, especially with WordPress. You don't really have an excuse. Um, in uh, presenting a clear and consistent nav, oh no, I'm repeating myself. Avoiding CSS and other stylistic markup to present content or meaning. Um, this goes back to like using just color, right? For example, to highlight something. If you have something, if you have a sale on your site and you just use red, 
people might not see that, right? But if you use like, you know, like one of those pointy star things around sail, that's at least like one way to say, all right, this is a sail versus, you know, just normal text on the page, right? Um, defining abbreviations and acronyms. Um, this kind of depends on what the content of your site is. Like if you are just a really tech heavy site, then you probably don't expect your, like normal newbie tech people to visit your site. So that's okay. But just if you are introducing something, try and not use abbreviations at least the first time around. So people, even if it's a screen reader, they at least know the first time what the hell this meant. I'm just, I'm gonna stop trying. Have unique, <laughs> have unique and relevant titles and meta descriptions. Um, this goes, uh, goes into SEO, right? So if you have a title for a blog, blog page, try not to use that same title again. Um, if you are using, uh, for example, um, Yoast SEO, if you use the plugin, and at the bottom, after you've made your, your post, you can go in and you can define exactly what you want your meta description and your alt tag and et cetera, et cetera, to be. And it's super handy because it's just right there and you kind of have no excuse to ignore it at that point. Um, but using those things, it takes an extra five minutes when you're setting up the post or the page, but it helps so much because it's, you know, it helps, if nothing else, it helps on Google, with Google finding your page. Um, so yeah, that's the entire list. Uh, feel free to read it without me too, because it's important. Um, and so yeah, these are the resources. You still can't read them, but uh, they exist. Uh, and uh, they're, they're really great. They're really good starting off points for what's going on. Um, and they're not all just like super techy, you know, like code heavy or anything like that. I tried to keep this as not code heavy as possible um, because just even knowing these things will help. And you guys can always look up, you know, how to write something in whatever code. So, yeah. Mm Um, so for skip nav links, they are handy sometimes. Um, it, it honestly depends on how much you have going on on the page, that whether you want to even use them or not. Um, in terms of forms, I'm not sure uh, how, how exactly, because like form reader or screen readers will read forms with just, you know, they'll just read straight down so it won't make sense, right? It won't, you know, keep in line with like this line is this relevant piece of content. Um, for that, I don't know what you can do for forms, honestly. If someone else does know, um, please feel free to shout it out and tell us all. Um, for screen readers, you want to look at using ARIA logins to do things, um, especially with form kinds. There are lots of ARIA tags for time and labels. And then you put elements mm -hmm. together, and then natively, of course, tying your labels and your input elements together. Um, so watch your form plugins. Some are better at accessibility than others. Yeah. Um, so it's just something to keep in mind. I've not actually. Um, it's a. It's interesting. I did. Um, I did a site for a, a client of several months ago, and he had hundreds of pages of data and tables. But he um, he basically just. Because he had so many pages of content, uh, he kind of just gave up, which is not a good answer at all. Um, but in terms of like, he tried to make, make it accessible in other ways, even though the tables were, um, he was, his former developer had used tables to organize the content on his page, uh, even though it wasn't content that needed to be organized within tables. So a lot of times we were able to just like delete the table entirely. Um, but when it was words, um, when it was words and actual content that needed to be in tables, um, we ended up, we did have descriptions of what's going on. And so that way, at least, you know, kind of know what's going on. But we didn't, we didn't solve that issue with screen readers specifically. But, yeah. 
So I've uh, only, there's still like 20 minutes left. If people are hungry, that's cool too. <laughs> yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Um, it's, it's surprisingly how large, how many people use the internet is crazy, right? Even 10 years ago, it wasn't, you know, it's growing all the time. Um, and it's not, it's not just somebody that's colorblind and it's not just like people are stuck at home sometimes. They, even it, it, like they broke their leg and they're stuck inside. Uh, actually, I was talking to one of the, um, one of the speakers last night um, and he had severe scoliosis growing up. Uh, and so they basically had to, like, they stuck a bunch of metal in the spine. Um, and so he was out for a while. Um, but, you know, injuries can take you out for a few months, but people are stuck for years because they're stuck. And how else can they um, interact with the world other than through the screen that they have? So, yeah, I totally agree. That's like, I wish I'd made that point because I, heart, I very much agree with just if you're stuck inside, this is one way to not feel so stuck. things that were set up that make your site SEO friendly mm -hmm. are actually part of the American Disabilities Act mm -hmm. and like have to do with accessibility. Yeah. So to abuse those tools on the other side, like Google's algorithm has really focused on usability and user experience as being a defining factor of why they make changes. Mm -hmm. And it's because they really don't want you to abuse these opportunities you have with listed today yeah. and just use them for like marketing. Mm -hmm. No, that stuff was built to better communicate what's going on on the page. And so I just appreciate you bringing that you know, into focus for people because I think people are very, they have no idea that it's connected at all. Yeah, you definitely. Know? And so you have places, like I always teach in some of my SEO classes, if it's a picture of a butterfly, mm -hmm. you don't say it's a picture of Asheville Accounting Services. Yeah. It's not. It's yeah. a butterfly. Somebody mm -hmm. is going to see that alt mm -hmm. tag. So that alt field was yeah. not created for no purpose. It's squeeze a bunch of information that's mm -hmm. relevant in there it was actually put there for a reason so yeah, yeah it's really important definitely. for people to understand because it's, it's something that sort of lacks in the whole the whole seo industry we ne almost never discuss yeah but the origin of a lot of our strategies are around mm -hmm. um, websites being more accessible yeah please don't stuff keywords please 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 yeah <laughs> That's such a good way to put it. Okay. Right? So you go in and you in your browsing you turn off images, you turn off JavaScript, you show them the page the way it looks, and all of a sudden you know it's a text and something may go away. You know, if it's JavaScript enabled, then it completely go away. And you know, oh okay, then this isn't a parent enabled or screen enabled. And that gives people a visual of oh okay, it makes sense now, right? Definitely. Mm -hmm. There's like there's statistics of like how many people use screen readers, but I don't know of anything that tells you of your site who read it via screen reader. I'm not sure that it's possible. If someone else knows, please tell. Me. Yeah. Um, if you look at uh, the second one and the third one, okay. they both, um, the first one is the parent page and the second one is one of the sub pages that's linked inside of it. Um, both of them tell, talk about web standards and accessibility. Um, and then uh, the implementation plan, which is one, two, three, four, the fifth one down, 
is also uh, really great. Um, in terms of uh, web accessibility evaluation tools, which I found really helpful, just like looking at my own site, um, the header image kind of becomes really blah when it's you know looked at with a screen reader or not screen with a color blindness. Um, so that helps a lot. It sort of gives you ways to look at your site in ways that other people would be seeing your site. Um, but yeah, and. Uh, Yeah. Um, I can pull up the article if you guys are interested in seeing it, but that's that, that is the end of my words coming out of my mouth at least. <laughs> <But>. <laughs>